Hello lovely people! Welcome to the very first 2020 entry into my historical figures playlist. If you're just joining us and you enjoy learning about queer or disabled people of the past who did amazing things, then subscribe. Today we're going to be talking about Ada Lovelace, an English mathematician and writer, the first to recognise that computers had applications beyond pure calculation, and is thus sometimes called the woman who wrote the first algorithm. She lived a tempestuous but sadly short life with many exciting twists that we will be discussing today. Whilst not necessarily classed as disabled, Ada struggled with chronic illness throughout her life and managed to achieve many wonderful things despite dealing with a body that occasionally paralysed. Which is something my body does because I have hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, so I can relate. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. It's my first sponsored historical profile, yay! Skillshare is an online learning platform that harnesses the power of video to teach a range of topics. You'll remember from my DIY vintage hairpiece video that Skillshare have a number of kind of crafty lessons, but they also branch out into very technical areas with everything from coding to music production. Already a large number of courses are captioned and they're looking to extend that across the site, which is something talked about in my class pick of the day. Inclusive UX, designing websites for everyone by Regine Gilbert, a UX designer and accessibility expert. UX means user experience, by the way. Her Skillshare original course focuses on the importance of prioritising a user experience that includes people of all abilities. The class is only 30 minutes long, but it really packs in key ideas and tools and best practices for creating an inclusive and welcoming website and digital products. You don't need to be an expert to understand this course because, <laughs> believe me, I'm not at all clued in on coding or the um, modern computing. Stuff. But if you're a budding Ada or an old hand, you'll still be able to take something away from this course because remember now, inclusion is key. Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to help you explore your creativity. Just click the link in the description box and after that it's only around $10 a month, which is really worth it when you think about it, especially compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. As a member, you also have the opportunity to give and receive feedback on projects through the creators community which is really helpful when learning a new skill. Whether you're interested in using your tech prowess for good or just learning some simple painting techniques, click that link to get started. The Honourable Augusta Ada Byron was born in England on the 10th of December 1815 to Anne Isabella Noel Byron, 11th Baroness Wentworth and George Gordon Byron, the 6th Baron Byron, more commonly known as Lord Byron, the poet and terrible father. Okay, I added the second bit, but you'll see. Ada's mother, Anne Isabella, commonly nicknamed Annabella, was a highly educated and strictly religious woman. As a child, her extreme intelligence had been cultivated by her parents, who hired as her tutor a former Cambridge University professor. Her education thus proceeded much like that of a Cambridge student, with studies involving classical literature, philosophy, science and mathematics. In fact, Lord Byron nicknamed her his Princess of Parallelograms. Right, side note, you may find it confusing that Lord Byron is called Lord Byron despite being a baron. Well, yes, the British peerage is confusing, but to break it down, there are five ranks of peer in the UK. And yes, they still exist. In descending order, Duke, Marquess, Earl, Viscount and Baron. Lord is a kind of generic term that is used to denote members of the peerage and most often used by barons who are rarely addressed by their formal title. The correct way of addressing Byron would be the Lord Byron, but no one actually says the because that's unwieldy. Marquesses, earls and viscounts are also commonly addressed as Lord, but dukes aren't because they use the style the Duke of Cambridge for example. Formally, you would address them as your grace rather than my lord because religion. And that's a story for another time. Annabella was a cold, stiff, religious woman and an unlikely match for the amoral and agnostic poet Lord Byron. She met him socially in 1812 because he had begun a relationship with her cousin's wife. Red flag! Byron's popularity was soaring following his many literary successes, but he was deeply in debt because he refused to make money from his work as he believed business was not appropriate for a gentleman and seemed to prefer extreme financial distress. Red flag! She also suspected that Byron was having an affair with his half-sister. Do I need to say it? Red flag! 
He proposed in October 1812 through her aunt, and in response, Annabella wrote a scathing summary of his character and refused him, telling her mother, he is a very bad, very good man. However, played with an obsession for her modesty and intellect, Byron proposed again in September 1814, and Annabella decided that, aware of Byron's rage, floundering, drinking, and money troubles, it was her Christian duty to support him and improve his behaviour. Wow, what a great basis for a marriage. If only she'd had better friends who could point out that was a stupid idea. During the summer of 1815, he began to unleash his anger and hostility on his wife. His moods were dark, he drank heavily, and he began an affair with an actress. Annabella, now pregnant, became extremely distressed and wrote to Byron's half-sister, Augusta Lee, the aforementioned half-sister, who travelled to the Byron's home to assist, and upon arrival became the new subject of Lord Byron's wrath. On the 10th of December, Annabella gave birth to Ada, but this only seemed to increase Byron's despair. He had written in letters that he expected his child to be a glorious boy, and was highly disappointed when she turned out to be a girl. He named her Augusta Ada Byron, after the half-sister he, again, was clearly far too fond of, who had the year before given birth to a child that the family were pretty sure was Byron's. That's great. On the 16th of January, 1816, Lord Byron commanded that Lady Byron left for her parents' home and took five weeks old Ada with her. It was to be the last time that Ada ever saw her father. He left England four months later and officially separated from his wife. Although British law at the time granted full custody of children to the father in case of separation, Lord Byron made no attempt to claim his parental rights and died of disease in the Greek War of Independence, fighting the Ottoman Empire when Ada was eight years old. Lady Byron remained incredibly bitter and continued throughout her life to make allegations about her husband's immoral behaviour, which we probably can't judge her for, to be fair. But it, it, I mean, it likely wasn't good for her own mental health. In an attempt to prevent Ada from developing her father's perceived insanity, Lady Byron promoted Ada's interest in mathematics and logic, steering her away from anything judged to be frivolous. Ada was not even allowed to see a portrait of her father until her 20th birthday. As you can perhaps already imagine, Ada did not have a close relationship with her mother, although due to societal attitudes of the time, which again favoured the father in separations, Lady Byron had to present herself as a loving mother. But in reality, Ada was instead left in the care of her maternal grandmother, Judith, who did actually dote on her. But in order to prove her good mothering, Lady Byron wrote anxious letters to her mother concerning her daughter's welfare, with a cover saying to show them to people, because, yeah. She did have an unfortunate habit of referring to her daughter as it, though, which isn't exactly on the list of prime mothering. Neither of her letters stating, I talk to it for your satisfaction, not my own, and shall be very glad when you have it under your own. Thanks, Mum. As a teenager, Ada was fiercely watched by close friends of her mother for any sign of moral deviation. Beginning in early childhood, Ada struggled with bouts of illness and from the age of eight, experienced headaches that obscured her vision, which I also relate to a lot, having lost my vision in my left eye from a migraine. Oh, relatable historical figures. In June 1829, at the age of 14, she was paralyzed during a bout of measles and was subjected to bed rest for nearly a year like I was. It took her two years to be able to walk again with the help of crutches, during which time she used a wheelchair. <laughs> she used this recovery time to develop her mathematical and technological skills. As a 12-year-old, she decided she wanted to fly and went about the project methodically, passionately, constructing wings from different materials and in different sizes. She examined the anatomy of birds to determine the right proportion between the wings and the body and wrote a book with illustrative plates called Flyology because... Yes, that's just the kind of incredible child she was. Her upbringing was certainly unusual for an aristocratic girl in the 1800s. Mathematics and science were not really a standard affair for women at the time, but she'd inherited her mother's extreme intelligence and her father's imaginative prowess. Lady Byron believed that only rigorous study could prevent Ada from developing her father's mental illness. Not how that works. Yet, she also believed that forcing her daughter to lie completely still for long periods of time whilst awake would somehow develop her self-control. Unsurprisingly, Lady Byron did not win any parenting awards. 
Fortunately, Ada had a natural aptitude for numbers and language, and she was taught by the social reformer William Friend and the Scottish astronomer and mathematician Mary Somerville, who was one of the first women to be admitted to the Royal Astronomical Society. Around the age of 17, Ada met the famous mathematician and inventor Charles Babbage through Somerville. Babbage clearly saw something great in Ada and became her mentor. She was fascinated with Babbage's ideas and inventions. Known now as the father of the computer, Babbage was at that time inventing the Difference Engine, a machine that performed mathematical calculations and showed it to Ada before it was finished. In her work, Ada often questioned assumptions by integrating poetry and science. While studying differential calculus, she wrote to her tutor, Augustus de Morgan, I may remark that the curious transformations many formula can undergo, the unsuspected and to a beginner apparently impossible identity of forms exceedingly dissimilar at first sight is I think one of the chief difficulties in the early parts of mathematical studies. I am often reminded of certain sprites and fairies one reads of, who are at one's elbows in one shape now, and the next minute in a form most dissimilar. She believed that both intuition and imagination were critical to effectively applying mathematical and scientific concepts, and valued metaphysics, the brand of philosophy that examines the fundamental nature of reality, as much as mathematics. She described her approach as poetical science. On being presented at court at the age of 17, she became immensely popular, thanks both to her rather infamous parentage, but also her brilliant mind. She danced at many balls, becoming a regular at court, and was described as being dainty and charming. At the age of 20, in July 1835, she married William, 8th Baron King, and became Lady King. He supported his wife's academia, and they shared a love of horses, going on to have three children, I mean, it's the most British thing you've ever heard of, love of horses. And they went on to have three children together. Byron and Isabella, called Annabella, and Ralph Gordon, and yes, all three of them were pretty much named after Ada's parents. She apparently was pretty strong-willed. Immediately after the birth of Annabella in 1837, Ada once again became very ill with a bite of cholera. She was already battling with asthma and digestive problems and took months to shake the illness, during which time doctors gave her painkillers like laudanum and opium, and reportedly she experienced mood swings and hallucinations. Probably because she was high. Ada was a descendant of the Baron's Loveless, a title that had gone extinct. And thus, when her husband was made an Earl in 1838, they chose to take up the mantle Earl of Loveless and Viscount Ockham, making Ada Countess Loveless. Yes, the British aristocracy is confusing. Should I make an explainer video about it? Would that be helpful for future historical videos? Ada was asked to translate an article on Babbage's analytical engine by Italian engineer Luigi Federico Menebra... Ah, names for a Swiss journal. She not only translated the complex scientific language into English, just casually brilliant, but added her own thoughts and ideas on the machine itself. Her notes, which she named notes, gotta love an economical girl, ended up being three times longer than the original piece and was published in 1843 in an English science journal. Within them, Ada describes how codes could be created for the device to handle letters and symbols along with numbers. She also theorized a method for the engine to repeat a series of instructions, a process known as looping that computer programs use today. Within notes is what many historians consider to be the very first computer program, i.e. an algorithm designed to be carried out by a machine. Yet. Others refute this, pointing out that Babbage's personal notes from previous years contain the building blocks of Ada's ideas, which, fine. Either way, Ada brought a fresh perspective, a vision for the capability of computers to go beyond mere calculating or number crunching, while many others, including Babbage himself, focused only on those specific capabilities. So basically, Ada was really cool. Her notes were labelled alphabetically from A to G, and note G contained not only the first published algorithm specifically tailored for implementation on a computer, as we said, but also Ada's dismissal of artificial intelligence. She wrote that the analytical engine has no pretensions whatsoever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truth. Her objection has gone on to be the subject of much debate, including in Alan Turing's paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, and yes, I will indeed be doing a historical profile on Alan Turing at some point. So Ada cared deeply for a number of different academic projects in a range of scientific fields, including phrenology, a pseudoscience which involves the measurement of bumps on the skull to predict mental traits. 
and mesmerism. Her interest in the brain was part of a, a long-running preoccupation that she had inherited from her mother about her own potential for madness. In 1844, she wanted to begin a mathematical model for understanding how the brain gives rise to thoughts and nerves to feelings, a calculus for the nervous system, but this was never completed. Her interest in mathematics didn't always work out so well, I, she created a very large gambling syndicate and made an ambitious attempt in 1851 to create a mathematical model for betting, but ended up in thousands of pounds of dirt instead. Her husband wasn't pleased. She also had a relaxed approach to friendships with men that led to numerous rumours of affairs, but in fairness, I mean, it wasn't hard for Victorian women to overstep lines, so. And again, she wasn't as bad as her dad, if that's a defence. In 1841, Lady Byron confessed to Ada and her cousin, Elizabeth Medora Lee, that Lord Byron had fathered them both. And boy did Elizabeth lead a life! So she lived in a menage a trois with her older sister and her husband, had a baby by him, escaped a convent, had another baby by him, ran away to France with him, decided to become a nun, had another baby, had an affair with a French naval officer who kind of like abandoned her, married his servant, had another baby, and eventually died of smallpox. So Lord Byron really did have some very adventurous genes. Ada died at 36, the exact same age at which her father had died, on the 27th of November 1852 from uterine cancer, but more immediately from the bloodletting from her doctors, which is never a good idea. She was buried at her request next to the father she never got a chance to know, at the Church of St Mary Magdalene in Hucknall, Nottinghamshire. Was Ada the world's first computer programmer? Whether she was or not, she was certainly the only person at the time to see the potential of the analytical engine as a machine capable of expressing entities rather than quantities, and that makes her truly special. Her mindset of poetical science led her to ask questions about the analytical engine that examined how individuals and society relate to technology as a collaborative tool. And could there possibly be a better moment to remind you to click the link in the description for your first two months of Skillshare for free? Collaborative learning through technology will make us all smarter. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please do let me know in the comments who you would like me to do a profile on next and subscribe if you haven't already. See you in my next video.